if we really think, what are we made up? We are made up of data. So we are data. So if we talk about data governance, data ownership, we talk about ownership of us. And so, you know, a bit of provocative thought. If we collectively don't get data governance in health right, we are very quickly in the space of becoming modern day data slaves of those who kind of claim to own that data. And I think that's why it's so fundamental, critical that we have tonight this conversation and really look at these uh, health data governance principles that transform health and many have developed as a first little infant step towards something that really the World Health Assembly and the World Health Organization needs to take extremely serious to think what kind of international instrument and framework is needed that we can safeguard people's data whilst deriving maximum public health and global health interest out of that data. So I'll keep it here quite short and would just like to sort of have the first sort of uh, interaction uh, of the panel. And we have really a, a very excellent uh, sort of panel with the Honorable Nima Lungangira. She's a member of parliament in Tanzania and active with uh, UNITE, that's a parliamentary group, and you will talk a little bit more about this then. Ricardo Lamberiello, he is the head of health at Tertesom. Thank you for, for being here. Yassin Diani from Senegal. Wonderful to be here. She's from a Young People's for Tech in Health Expert Network. And then we have Mark Landry. He is the senior specialist from the Digital Health Program at the Global Fund. And then last but not least, Jerome Moss. He's the director for Access and Care Technology from uh, Philips. And he brings really the private sector perspective. And I would like to start now with uh, you, um, <clears throat> Honorable Nima. From a Tanzanian perspective, sort of uh, where do you see the critical issues around data in health? And what do you see the role of parliamentarians within that space in terms of representing the citizens of your country? Um, thank you very much. As introduced, my name is um, Nema Lugangira. I'm a member of parliament in Tanzania. And I'm here as part of a field trip of the UNITE Global Parliamentarians Network to End Infectious Diseases. And I'll start by answering your question in the sense of the importance of having parliamentarians in these discussions. Because as you rightly said, we have a responsibility back home in our respective countries through our parliaments to speak on behalf of our citizens and ensure that they get improved health services. But what determines how, um, how informed we are and what level of understanding we are is by participating in such engagements. One, to learn of the you know, developments at global level, the global health um, development, but also while these discussions are happening to also bring to the table the realities from the ground. So I think, you know, I highly commend UNITE for extending this opportunity because usually African parliamentarians don't feature in such platforms as they should or as our counterparts um, from European countries, America, etc. So that is one great takeaway to ensure that for us to do better, we need to be more involved. Um, now, coming on what we can do, as you know, um, in Tanzania is a developing country, so I'll speak in the context of the entire Africa, the African continent, in the sense that, one, we have a digital gap, but even within, even within country, we have digital inequality within a country. This is urban versus peripheral. So I come from a region called Kagera, which is a peripheral region, so I'll speak for those in the peripheral region who are often forgotten. Um, now, when we're talking about strengthening health systems in the peripheral, 
you have challenge of infrastructure. Do we have electricity? Do we have the mobile connectivity, just the normal 2G, 3G um, connectivity? You know, um, and then the second issue comes, do we have the digital skills and literacy to actually use the phones and use the digital, um, digital you know, innovations? Most people have mobile phones, but they use it maybe for two or three features. They don't use it to, you know, fully as, as, as how it should be. Um, third is our, our, the community health workers or those that work at the health system at the community level, do they know how to use the computers? How technical is that technology? Is it simple? If it breaks down, do we need to fly someone from Dar es Salaam or a neighboring country to fix it? So all of those, um, all of those dynamics. So one thing that I'm trying to do as a parliamentarian is to ensure that we find ways in which we can attract the digital investment in the rural regions and whatever digital um, advancement that is happening in the country should also remember the community. And one of the ways that even last week I tabled in Parliament is to see how can we use community networks. In the interim period that we don't have the you know the normal fiber optic fiber cables and etc, we can use community networks to connect schools to connect health centers to ensure that we're speaking they're speaking to each other. And why is it critical right now a patient let's say who's in Kagera if I fall sick. I'll probably go to the health center and I'll get my blood work done. Um, if I don't feel better, I'll have to go to the district hospital. I'll have to redo the entire blood work again. If I then have to go to the regional hospital, I'll have to redo the entire blood work again. And if I get referred to the national hospital, I have to redo the entire blood work again. So in that whole time, it's time loss, it's money, but it's also, you know, putting the patient at more risk and denying or you know limiting knowing what the issue is but if there was a way these things could speak to each other maybe i don't need to do and repeat all of these tests so definitely um you know digital is crucial to strengthen communities but then it brings an issue of data governance how is the data being protected is my personal details of my illness going to be floating around around whatsapp and social media so how can we protect the data and most of our african countries don't yet have data protection acts and data privacy acts so these things need to go hand in hand i think i can end there for now thank you yeah thank you very much and um, i think you illustrate some of the challenges you know this end-to-end -end integration and the importance of, of 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 health data and i think tonight it the, you know, this session really is is celebrating that sort of launch of that uh, health data governance principles, which uh, now more than 90 organizations actually have signed up, uh, including recently, I think the last who signed up is the World Bank, uh, but there's well regional sort of uh, digital health networks who have signed up, PATH and many others. I actually don't know whether Dech de Somme has signed up yet to that one. So, okay, good. So, so, so you're next. <laughs> Otherwise, you would have asked you first to sign it up. <laughs> no, no, it's not a prerequisite to speak here on the panel. Um, but so, from a civil society perspective, and, and I know that the new Dech de Somme is doing a lot of work, started in, in Burkina Faso on, 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 on sort of digital health with the government closely working in several countries now in, in West Africa. Uh, why for you is health data governance so, so important from a civil society perspective? Yeah, many thanks for having me here. And I would like to share the experience of, uh, of Terre de Zome. We started with the, with the MOH of Burkina Faso to uh, develop and deploy a digital health solution to help uh, healthcare workers uh, to better diagnose uh, sick children and, uh, and pregnant uh, women. And uh, over the time, uh, the, 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 this digital health initiative has been uh, scaled up to the national level with uh, over 1,900 healthcare facilities uh, equipped with uh, uh, with the, such initiatives. So when it comes then in, in terms of data, in, we generated the 16 millions of uh, child 
consultations uh, uh, that have been uh, going through uh, this digital tool. So improving the health uh, uh, quality. But so uh, if what are the risks if uh, this data is not uh, properly uh, governed? So I, I see basically two main uh, risks. Uh, the first one is, of course, uh, uh, protect data protection, uh, data, uh, the, the question about uh, ownership. But I also see another risk, which is uh, for me, I mean, being a statistician myself uh, by training, is uh, actually not exploiting uh, this data because this is an awful amount of data. And then when you talk about uh, uh, civil society, it's also it's very precious data. You often reach out patients and the people that are often left out. So civil society has the possibility really to, to go to the last mile. And as a matter of fact, many of the, of the uh, children that are registered through this digital uh, uh, solution, they are not registered in the, in the civil registry of the country. So we actually talk about uh, children that don't, they don't even exist uh, for, uh, for the country. So these are the two risks that I see. Uh, the fact that, that data protection, uh, data exploitation are very complex uh, topics. So it encompasses uh, the medical part, you have uh, uh, IT part, you have uh, uh, legal, uh, ethical, it's very, very complex. But then uh, when it comes to uh, civil societies, we are not equipped with those uh, uh, expertise. Third Desoma is, uh, is a fairly large uh, NGO. We are uh, 3,000 employees around the world, but we don't have a legal expert in, in our office. So how do we actually uh, manage uh, that? So. Uh, of course, uh, joining forces with other uh, civil societies. Uh, there have been uh, uh, donors that have actually supported the strengthening of our capacity. So now we have uh, two uh, statisticians uh, on board. But yeah, it's, 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 it's very, very complex. And I think in that, uh, for that end, a, a global uh, digital health, uh, uh, di digital health data governance would actually help, not only in terms of guidance, seeing where we should go and how to better integrate the different systems, but also converging the efforts, the financial efforts and, the, um, and providing yeah, the financial uh, and the human resources to achieve all of that, because otherwise it is <laughs> extremely complex. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think that that complexity really is is made more challenging because digital is abstract and and many for us you know we we are more trained in analog thinking but and so we we, we tend to do analog policy making and and data you don't see you don't really you know know what happened with this it's somewhere in the cloud yeah i mean okay which cloud <laughs> and and i think that really is is Putting policymaker into a very challenging situation, plus the, the the rate of development is so fast that that by the time you feel you had an ID, it, the field has already moved, and that's why these sort of uh, health data governance principles are so critical. And and now I think by now I hope you all wonder what are actually these principles, and I hope I kind of was getting your appetite plus the room almost full now so that Matilda Forslund, the executive director of Transform Health, actually will come up and give us a short presentation on what these uh, data governance principles are. Thank you so much, Matilda. Hello. Um, so Distinguished guests, uh, guests and partners, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, it's a pleasure seeing the room full um, and to have you all here. So for all of us that don't know Transform Health, uh, we're a global coalition of organizations committed, uh, committed to achieving universal health coverage uh, by harnessing the potential of digital technology and data. And we were set up by seven founding members uh, in 2019. Uh, and have grown to over 50 coalition members um, 
advocating and campaigning for stronger political will, a global health data governance framework, which, was, which we're here to talk about today, and increased and coordinated investment for digital health transformation. So Transform Health and Partners recognize the need for improved governance uh, of health data, and the, the, really the need for uh, global alignment to support more equitable and responsible health data management, while safeguarding data privacy, ownership, and security. So as we all know, as, as health systems and other parts of our lives have become increasingly digital, volumes of health data and health-related data continues to really expand. However, national, regional and global rules to govern the co collection and use of data have not really kept pace uh, with the growing potential for data uh, to, support de uh, uh, um, to support better uh, health and well-being or the potential harms arising from the, from the misuse of data. The COVID-19 pandemic has also demonstrated the importance of timely, accurate and disaggregated health data and the value of sharing data across borders um, uh, and at the same time misinformation uh, and cases of health data being used for political and commercial gain have highlighted the need to build public trust in data systems and safeguard personal uh, data. So this is really why Transform Health is calling for a, a global health data governance framework underpinned by equity and human rights based principles, uh, which uh, we hope to be adopted by governments. Um, so I'll just click to the next slide here. Um, so in this regard, we have been stewarding the development of a set of health data gov governance principles, which I think Stefan has mentioned. And over the last year and a half, um, together with our policy circle, which is, uh, is, is a, uh, a working group of many of our members, we have facilitated an inclusive and consultative uh, process to develop the principles, which has been largely driven by civil society organizations. And the process was designed to really gather perspectives and experts and ensure meaningful engagement by diverse stakeholders, including youth uh, and women-led organizations across uh, geographies and sectors. So we have had, we've had held eight global and regional uh, workshops held across different regions uh, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the Middle East, North Africa, Asia, Latin America, Europe and North America. Um, and we've also had over 200 contributions uh, from over 130 organizations uh, from, you know, the, the, across sectors. Um, so the principles uh, were launched on uh, uh, World Health Day uh, on the 7th of April and they really recognize and build uh, on exis existing norms, other principles and other guidelines also around health data governance. But what, what's really distinct about these principles is the process through which they were developed, their applicability as well as their framing and content. They are also applicable to a wide range of stakeholders. In, term, um, in terms of their framing um, and content, they bring a human rights and an equity lens to the use of data within and across health systems. US, UHC is also at the core, which must be a core aspect of the design and development of data-driven health systems. And importantly, uh, and as I mentioned, the principles are a significant step towards the development of a global health data governance framework, framework, which would provide a shared vision and guideline for the governance of health data. So I'll tell you a little bit about, so we have eight principles and they are really clustered around three objectives. So this includes the first objective, which is protecting people, uh, which considers the importance of individual group and community data. Um, data protection um, and then the second objective which is to promoting health value through data sharing and innovative uses of data and speaks to the collect collective needs and benefits of public health systems and then the third objective is prioritizing equity uh, by ensuring equitable distribution of benefits that arise from the use of data in health systems and requires equity among groups and, and individuals. 
I would also encourage you all to go to, our, to the, the Health Data Governance Principles website. It's healthdatagovernance.org, where you can really read uh, about the principles. Um, there's also a lot of use cases um, uh, and advocacy toolkits and communication toolkits that you can use to, um, to, to further um, use the, the, um, and apply the principles to your local context. So they have been endorsed, as Stefan mentioned, by over 90 organizations, including global, regional and national organizations, as you can see here on the slide. Some of them, uh, we, we don't fit all 90, unfortunately. Um, and we really encourage wide endorsement of the principles, including by all of you here today, hopefully. I hope you will get you to sign up. Um, and to guide the collection and use of da data at national, regional and international levels. By endorsing these principles, we hope that they can support um, to update policies and practices on data governance nationally, um, but also to increase support to communities and civil society groups, particularly youth and, uh, and women-led organizations, to advocate for more equitable health data um, and right-based approach, uh, approaches to health data governance, um, and to hold stakeholders accountable. Um, and we also really encourage other partners and governments to come on a journey uh, with us to champion the need for a global framework. And we hope that the principles can really provide the basis for that. So my final slide, uh, this, is, this is the roadmap that we're seeing in the coming years. And this is the roadmap that we hope you will all join us uh, on. Um, so Transform Health is calling for all governments to, put, to really put health data governance and a global framework on the agenda of the next WHO Executive Committee um, meeting in January 2023 and at the World uh, Health Assembly in 2023. We also call for government, governments to sponsor a resolution mandating the WHO uh, to develop a global health data governance framework and ensuring it's de uh, it's, it is developed through a fully inclusive process and really including you know the the, the sectors that we see here today um, uh, uh, as well as others so we encourage all partners to support and champion this agenda with us today and over the coming year and um, with that i'd like to hand back to stefan uh, to continue the panel <laughs> thank you thank you very much and I think we are at a good stage at the moment. Last year, <clears throat> the WHO had the Health Data Governance Summit that really recognized the importance of this. Even going back a little bit further, there was the UN High Level Panel on Digital Collaboration, which came very strongly out on, on this. And then there was as well the Lancet Financial Times Commission on Governing Health Futures that has a set of very important recommendations. And it really looks like, I think the time has come that, 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 that the world is basically embracing this as, at a global level and, and, and start a process that is adequate and dynamic and inclusive to bring this. And the inclusive aspect, I would like to go now to, to you, Yassin, is, is really on the, the, the importance for young people in terms of you know, why have you been personally and as the network been so actively involved in the development of these, uh, these principles? Thank you so much, Stefan. Uh, I think I want to piggyback on the point you made before. Um, as somebody from Senegal, um, I think it's important to, again, reiterate um, that there are so many young people out there uh, from the global south who would have benefited so much from being among us, but again, because of policies that don't allow, you know, people like me with certain passport to easily come to these um, places. And I think we are missing a lot on those knowledge, those experiences. I think this is something that we all of us should, you know, take with us and show all of us should um, think about how can we change this? How can we allow these other young people who are brilliant have so much to contribute to be um, in this um, environment to bring their understanding and their experiences? Um, so maybe I will just um, quickly introduce um, Young Expert Tech for Health. So uh, I am here sitting today representing the Young Expert Tech for Health, which is um, a youth-led organization. And as a youth-led organization, we are aiming at really 
putting young people and young people's voices out in, in this digital health um, discussions. And we are really hoping to, as you know, people say, we are the most digitally connected uh, generation. We are hoping to leverage our expertise and experiences and be able to bring that in digital health and be able to leverage digital health for um, universal health coverage um, goals in 2030. And so back to your question on why it's important for us um, to really push for stronger and better health data governance. Uh, maybe I will just say that as young expert tech for health, we have been involved in the design and the, the elaboration of this principle. Um, and we really thank Transform Health for understanding the needs uh, for young people to be at the table and for us to take part in the process, not at the implementation, but really from the beginning. Because I think that's really, it's we have to be there in the whole process. And for me personally, um, based on my personal experience being from Senegal um, and looking at our health system, I think health data governance is um, important for many reasons. I think Honorable Nima has mentioned some of those. But I think for me, it's about trust. It's about building trust uh, with your consumers, but also with the actors in, in, in health. Um, and so I think um, looking at my, my personal contacts in, in Senegal and maybe in Africa, um, especially with, with COVID-19, but again, with a lot of issues that we do have in our healthcare system, there is this, this lack of trust um, between you know, the consumers, the citizen, and also the health system, but also the governance of the health system. And I think um, we all here believe that digital health is is a great tool to really rebuild our health system and strengthen it. And if we are using this tool, we really need everybody involved to trust that this tool will you know, propel the community and really um, give us the quality and the equitable care that we all deserve. Um, and I think for us, trust in, in this process means two things. Trust, again, with governance, implementing this, this digital health governance, um, and this principle being at the heart of it, because these are principles that are rooted in human rights. Um, and that's really important for us young people in, our, in all of our diversity, um, to, to say. And the second part of the trust, I think, is within the action. I think earlier, as I was um, talking to Ricardo, he asked me, what does trust mean? Uh, what, what would it take for you to believe that the trust is happening? And that got me thinking, I think when it comes to digital uh, with the government, with government in general and the digital world, I think it's a little bit as uh, I'll give you a bit of a, a visual picture uh, of a turtle and a rabbit. And I think governance are like the turtle and, you know, digital world is like the rabbit. It's moving so fast. And then the government is always trying to catch up. Right. And I think policies are great. I mean, they are the beginning of the process. We need to have strong data governance principles and, you know, policies there. But then how do we catch up with with the rabbit? How do we catch up with technology that are moving so fast? Right. Ten years ago, we didn't have the iPhones we have now. So how do we do that? And I think the way we do that is by you know, involve with everybody. So for us, civil society, young people, we don't have the means to get everybody at the table, but guess who does? The government. And so bringing, bringing, bringing all of us at the table, you know, young people, the private sector, um, you know, the civil society, and themselves being at the table, that will allow, in a sense, to continue with my visual picture, to, to have a you know, bicycle for this rabbit, you know, because all of us together, you know, again, with, we as young people are able to, understand digital health um, better or maybe faster than the older generation, no offense. Uh, and I think that that helps a lot when we are at the table to really keep up. Um, and I think if we are policy, if we have policies that are up to date, then trust is there because we know that our government care enough to you know, make sure that everything is up to date and is, you know, it's being refreshed as we go and that we are not doing policies you know, that are for 2020, now in 2022. And maybe one last, one last point, I think for us, uh, I've, I've heard a great quote um, that says, a decision made without me is a decision made against me. I think that's for us, that's what young people, we believe. And so for us, um, Yet for Age, we've launched a campaign um, last week uh, with our partners, um, with, which are also youth-led organization and Stop Age and others. And the campaign is really 
around asking our government, and I think this is a good option today to also ask um, those who are representing governments today, what are you doing to make sure that next year, by this time next year, that when you're reporting on your digital health strategy for WHO, what are you doing to make sure that our young, us young people, our needs are met in that? So that's the question I leave, I leave to you, and hopefully I'll get an answer. Or you can, you know, you can see on, on our e-action, we can hold you accountable through there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasin. And, and I think, you know, you, you, yeah, let's give a, a round of applause. I think what you illustrate is as well that if you really look where a lot of the innovations are happening, it's actually young, uh, especially in Africa, but elsewhere, young digital entrepreneurs are starting to drive. And I think governments are much more open, actually, for local innovations, local digital solutions by local developers. And that's, I think, for governments, it's helpful to, to at least share with them these, these, these data health governance principles so that their solutions are, it's in their business interest and it's in your interest as a government. In, it's in their business interest. They cannot scale it outside of your country if they don't adhere from the beginning to some of these you know, principles. So there's a business interest for them. Uh, but we see a lot of these solutions, they're well intended, but they are the last thought is about human rights and whether they are, you know, rights abiding. They're just solution focused. So let's go to the Global Fund, who has done a lot, actually, through your programs in digital health, working with government. What are you doing engaging with governments around uh, health data government governance and, and what do you see as moving forward from the Global Fund's perspective? Great, great. Thanks, Stefan. I'm Mark Landry the Global Fund. And, um, First and foremost, thanks Transform Health and the sponsors for having me here. Um, we have not formally endorsed the principles, but we're in that process. Why? Because, uh, okay, great. <laughs> but it's, 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 a little bit, it's a little bit slower for some of the multilateral international organizations to do so. Uh, but nonetheless, they resonate with us. And of course, why? Because they're quite robust and they're rational and they're needed. And, um, you know, quite frankly, I, I mean, what we want to see happen next is putting these principles into practice. And so uh, how are we doing that? How are we promoting that? How can we encourage other development partners to do so? Uh, it, it's important that we uh, take advantage of opportunities that present themselves, uh, certainly around um, the way that we are set up to uh, support countries uh, with their development, in our case, through our grant making process. Uh, we're starting a replenishment cycle this year. Um, funding requests will go out into the year, early next year, and the grants will be uh, developed and, and coming back to us. And just to give you an example, there's, there's a couple things I would say we would want to see uh, different in, in, in some of the, the, the grants that are put up. Uh, moving from uh, the data availability to data agility. Uh, what we mean is, is how can we rapidly uh, you know, harvest that uh, data and translate that uh, into um, you know, actionable uh, evidence-based decision support um, to improve the, the, the health outcomes and, and, and improve the um, effectiveness of the interventions. We have uh, put a lot of effort into um, that production of the data around the availability for such a long time. We need indicators. We have to measure the performance and the success of programs and uh, the way that these monies and, and limited resources that are pledged are, are spent um, equitably and effectively um, getting the most value. So, so, you know, thinking about this in terms of uh, uh, operationalizing that, uh, it's all about the way that uh, we can support, of course, the country ownership and leadership that is always the bedrock for effective uh, data governance uh, and, and, and improving not only in, in today's age uh, as uh, we, we've heard so much already about uh, the linkages between data and digital. Uh, quite frankly, they're much uh, inseparable in, in the uh, low and resource uh, country context that we're working in. Uh, and, and so uh, as, as we've also seen our investments in the past um, many funding cycles, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the container and we need to focus more on the content. Uh, we've, we've invested a lot in applications and systems and software uh, to generate that data uh, and, and produce it. Uh, and so now we want to see more attention and focus on uh, how are we managing the security and the, and the confidentiality and the privacy of that information, as we heard uh, from our first uh, panelist 
uh, and, and how are we recognizing the importance of the shareability and, and, and how data is exchanged uh, and what standards are we committing to? Uh, so I, I think for us, uh, you know, it's really about eking out more um, uh, stewardship and accountability and, and responsibility of the, of the data uh, that first and foremost is for country use and for the own uh, priorities aligned with the national strategies, policies, and plans to achieve UHC uh, and, and other objectives. Uh, and how can we uh, get behind uh, those existing platform systems, solutions, et cetera, uh, to embed some of these very important aspects uh, that I've mentioned already. Uh, so, so with that, I think, uh, you know, I can't speak on all development partners, but I can t tell you from our perspective, but I think it is consistent with what uh, we're seeing in the global uh, development partner community, uh, particularly in the data and digital health space. Uh, thanks, Deb. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> hope the Global Fund will soon <laughs> have signed up on them as well. Now, let me come to uh, Yedoen from Philips. And uh, let me put you a little bit on the spot. It's not part of the script. You know, have you signed up as Philips? And what are you planning to do as Philips? And does it work for private sector to sign them up? Or do you see any concerns that private sector has with these principles? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think that's a great question. I'm really happy to answer them. Um, but before we do so, can I just go back one step? Because why is it so important that we talk about health data governance? It's because we need the health data. And um, whether they're digital or paper-based, that doesn't really make a difference. My wife had an emergency C-section and she wouldn't have been here, my daughter wouldn't have been here if it weren't for all those people before her who had the same problem and that we learned from, that we used really to f further our medical practice. So this is really, it's not a choice right, whether we are going to use data or not, we, we must. It's, a, it's an ethical duty almost, I'd say. So that's just to make it, to bring it back to, at least me personally, but I think you have similar stories. Um, and we just need to go there. So what are the, the dangers if you don't go there of the, the risks? I, th I think we see them all over the place. It doesn't matter whether you go to Tanzania or to the Netherlands where I live uh, or to the United States, Indonesia, it's fragmented. We have silos, people don't work together. We cannot use uh, data. We can't even refer patients properly. So that's what we get if we do not develop a global uh, governance framework. I mean, it, it's there. We know what happens if we're not working on this simply not an option so you kind of say it's bad for business not to have a global framework um also is, yeah also yeah, yeah. and um if you go in there so uh, we, as philips we had even we're in the process by the way of uh endorsing this that we, we have discussions on um, what works for us and what what is a bit difficult still uh, I won't go into details now, but uh, uh, in general, fantastic, and we fully support it. Uh, there's just some legalese that we need to find out. Um, but we have our own data principles. Uh, we, we had them for years now. It's about data privacy by design. It's about data safety by design. It's about uh, only using data in a beneficial way for both the patient and the society at whole at large. They're on the, our websites, we're accountable, we're transparent in that, we want to be accountable and auditable on it. So that's, I think, the responsibility that we as a private sector company took and will be taking also in the future. Um, and that's another reason that we really advocate uh, a global health data uh, governance framework because it sets us back in a position where there is no legal framework because as Philips you have the, the policy that we adhere to uh, all legislation and ethical frameworks uh, and our internal uh, rules and regulations uh, whichever is strictest so when we are very strict that means we are far more expensive because it takes well, uh, it takes money to put everything in place so the cowboys uh, can develop farther, fur uh, faster further um, and make more so yes we would love to have a global uh, data governance framework in place to create a level playing field it also speeds up implementation so if you do not have to interface and that's not just for private sector it's also for well civil society as you just heard if you do not have to interface with 300 different systems not a joke but only with uh, two or three it saves a lot of time and a lot of money so it's really an implementation of uh, healthcare system strengthening it saves time it saves money and it gets us further um, and we can finally make patient referral a possibility instead of just a theme in our heads 
And we need, um, we need global governance. I mean, if we learned anything of the past uh, pandemic, we know the disease doesn't stay in a country, it's cross country, it goes everywhere. So we need to be able to collectively work together. Um, maybe on that personal note, within Philips, I work for group sustainability and those, well, sustainable issues are also difficult. Um, but they become a lot less difficult if you take a different frame of reference. If you do not see this earth uh, that we inherited from our parents with lots of problems, but when we see the earth uh, as something we have to uh, we uh, borrowed from our children, from young people here, uh, that we have to safeguard, then it becomes not easier, but a lot easier to work on with a lot more uh, energy. And I think we have the same with, uh, with our healthcare system. We learned a lot from everybody before us. Uh, we really stand on the shoulders of giants. So let us take our own responsibility and really implement this and make our world better for my daughter. She's seven now, fortunately still alive, thanks to all the people before us. And like you said, all the young people here. Thank you so much. And it's, I think it's that you know, really refreshing to hear from private sector the importance to have uh, you know, adequate sort of you know, frameworks and, and adequate regulations, specifically in an area that is so dear to each one of us. And, and it's a little bit the analogy, what you mentioned that otherwise those who are, you know, almost ruthless, they are the ones who can grow the fastest. And we've seen that with companies like Facebook, et cetera, that really, you know, are, are, are highly problematic. Um, and, and it's a bit like gardening, you know, if, if there is, if, if you don't nurture it, then I think governments, and we are getting soon then to the panel of, of government of, you know, representatives, is if you don't provide that nurturing environment, it's, it's like the garden is very quickly overtaken by weed and, and nothing really grows anymore except weed. So I think, you know, regulation has that space and therefore within the, the global sort of health data governance really is needed to move forward. So I would like to open it up now for questions from the audience. The physical audience, uh, unfortunately, the, the the live audience is too large, and uh, and and we didn't set up a, a sort of a mentimeter, etc., to get the audience uh, from here really actively engaged. So I open it up if there are any inputs, questions, comments, and uh, if you do so, please stand up, say your name quickly, and and try to keep it as as short and at questions uh, and not long interventions or statements. Hi, John Halpern. I'm wondering if you can explain more uh, specifically how the principles are protective and also um, when it comes to whistleblowers, I'm wondering if it addresses that um, they play an important role in enforcing data governance principles by identifying cases of wrongdoing and unfortunately they're often the victim of retaliation. So I'm wondering also if you can explain what specifically your foundation um, what kind of support it provides to whistleblowers and any of the other international organizations represented here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I maybe have uh, uh, Matilda as well, or, or from, somebody from Transform Health sort of really giving a little bit more on the protection side. Um, on just, you asked about our foundation. So we, we actually just launched a, a large partnership with Amnesty International and we announced it just seven days ago uh, on a large program called uh, Rights Click where we will, for the next six uh, years or so, work very deeply on, on, on some of the, the rights and, and uh, amnesty and digital rights. And Amnesty has done a lot of work in that space. And just on the whistleblower ourselves, we actually have a, a, an independent external whistleblower uh, that we contracted uh, and, and, and sort of have that system. And that's something we really should encourage much more, uh, these whistleblower system, even for governments and companies. They have a very important role to play so that when you see within the digital rights space solutions being implemented that are not abiding to human rights, that are dehumanizing, that actually there's a space for these things to happen. So the role of whistleblowers really, and I must say Switzerland, for example, is very bad protection for whistleblowers. Uh, that's really uh, not, not, not where we should be, but uh, you know, many countries really are not adequately having safeguards for whistleblowers, but over to you, maybe you. Yeah, so just maybe, 
you hear me okay? Just add a few comments on that. So yes, yeah, so the principles are very much framed, as we said, around kind of three objectives. And the first one being, well, they're not in any particular order, but one of them very much being around protecting people. So ensuring data security, um, but also to ensuring that security to build trust in data systems as well. So people are willing to share that data, which then builds it to then the other objectives around promoting health value so that people do share their data, but it's my data, our health. So how do we, how that sharing of data can help build and strengthen health systems to really improve the response of health systems based on the data. Um, and then the third one very much around um, prioritizing equity to making sure all people are represented in the data um, and very much how data can then be used to improve equitable access to health systems. So we do have that core objective around protecting people, but we go beyond that around promoting health value. Um, and then just in terms of, so while Health Transform Health has stewarded the development of the principles um, with our coalition partners and many other partners beyond that, we very much see them as being community owned. So we really want other stakeholders, this weather house on their own website, we want all stakeholders and communities to very much take the principles, own them, and themselves hold others accountable for implementing them and then using them to strengthen the governance of health data. Yeah, there's as well need for more like tools and guidance. So actually many organizations, but including I mentioned Amnesty International, they, they are working now on sort of a, a lab that really helps for, for human rights assessment of uh, sort of digital and AI solution that governments has easy, have an easy toolkit or startups have easy toolkit just to really to, to check what, you know, what their work is doing there. I think they are setting it up in the Netherlands, such a, a lab initially focusing on Europe, but then seeing how to expand that into other, other settings. Um, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Speaker. I'm from Farm Access and uh, part of this great initiative. So very proud to see it come uh, come to life. Um, I loved how Yassine was talking about trust, right? And I think a lot of this, what we're talking about, is really trust uh, and, and creating trust between partners. And with the various panel on the stage right now, a lot of technology is often developed by the private sector. and as a result, monetized too much by the private sector. But putting all that technology with the government is maybe not the best solution either. So I'm very keen to hear from the government and the private sector, how do we engage in a trusted relationship where we leverage both of the initiatives while making sure that it's meant for a global good, that contracts are not uh, all of a sudden increased in pricing, but also not cancelled all of a sudden. So I think that is sometimes hampering progress. I'm very keen uh, to hear from the panelists your thoughts on this. Thanks. Maybe let's hear from Nima from a parliamentarian perspective, not, not necessarily government, and then from, uh, from, your, from Philips. Um, thank you, although the question was directed to government and I'm not government, uh, but as a parliamentarian, I think one way in which you can um, achieve that trust is by involving different stakeholders. Oftentimes things are developed by the developing, um, if it's private sector, or the international organizations come up with solutions and then they come into a country with it being prescriptive and there is no involvement whatsoever. But if you involve the, and, and even when you involve, let's say, um, people at the national level, without taking into account the actual needs from the community level, that also doesn't make much sense. So it's very important to make sure that you involve the people and they know the benefits, the dangers, and they also give their own opinions and perspective on the, of the issue. But if it's one-sided, you know, being kind of shoved down on us, then it's not going to happen. It's the same thing why I said earlier on, it's important to involve parliamentarians in such discussions, because oftentimes, even if we're talking about, let's say, the data protection, the international community can develop a best practice data protection. Um, they have an international agreement, governments endorse it. And then at the end of the day, national parliaments have a role to play. But if we are not involved and we're not capacitated enough, there's a risk of us passing a data protection act which is probably weak and not governing the private sector enough because we're not well empowered so i think it's very important to ensure that there is that participation thank you 
No, fantastic. And, you know, they are like united or very important as well, the Interparliamentary Union. And I think that's a, a very important aspect to engage probably with the Interparliamentary Union. But let's hear from like from private sector to that trust question. Yes. I'm just fully aligned. I, I, <laughs> 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 that's the easy answer. I'll, I'll, I'll explain a bit more. <laughs> no, but I, I, we, I and we, we do trust in collaboration and that is uh, we don't only trust in collaboration, but that's also where trust is built. Um, and you can only build trust in an environment where you can uh, speak your mind to each other and where you're transparent uh, in what you want to achieve, um, and where you cannot go, um, and where you cannot work together, and where there are possibilities for collaboration. Um, I think those are basic things that we need. And for Philips, um, we work with the European governments, uh, with France, with uh, Germany. Why there? Because they're under GDPR and that's close to our own uh, company standards. Uh, on um, a federated health data space, including the governance. So we inform the governments on what is possible technically, what is not possible, uh, and also the, the pitfalls and the risks of uh, creating inadvertently data monopolies or uh, where we see if you do this uh, then it becomes very difficult for us uh, to for example check uh, medical equipment the effectivity of it but those are the things that we can raise uh, so that government uh, and policy makers can decide on i mean they have to decide what weighs uh, heavier thank you and nasin would like to because you brought up the trust question actually if I may add, I think maybe this is uh, what we get reproached as young people being a bit real, you know, over realist, over under realistic and naive. But I think we're not asking government to take on technology. I mean, I don't know where you live, but where I live, I wouldn't trust government to do that because they don't, they're not equipped to do that. We're just asking government to do what they meant to do is protect us from, you know, all of, you know, from the private sector or put it our interests, you know. So we're asking them to bring on these policies that are you know there to look out for our interests as consumers as people who are electing them to do that private sectors i mean nothing against private sectors i think you know they are also there to you know for economic reason but also they want to provide good solutions to people and to their consumers and to their users so i think if everybody especially government does its job of protection and then we as civil society as people in the between hold them accountable then i think we have a system that works where the private sector get their economic incentives and we get the benefits that we can from this you know brilliant brains behind this technology while government is serving as an oversight mechanism making sure that everybody is getting the best deal out of the system yes and i think when we talk about the trust the civil society ngos can play an important role i mean traditionally there's been a, a lot in terms of uh, uh, um also as, as a watchdog uh, observing what things uh, were doing if the governments or the private sector or other actors actually walked the, the, the talk but i think uh, so it, it is well positioned but then it goes back to my previous point about uh, are, are we well equipped to to play this role in the digital age i can take one more question and then we will have another round afterwards Gentlemen up front here, and then I'll, I'll come later in the next round to you. Oh, just, it's not just a question, it's just to say that I'm coming from Cameroon. I'm Dr. Etundi, uh, the director for, of disease control. I'm here on behalf of my, the Ministry of Public Health. First, to thank uh, Transform Health to help us to organize a workshop uh, in the beginning of this month concerning this problem of uh, advocacy in the government and uh, other partners to strengthen the governance of health data. So my ministry is very, very, very happy after this uh, uh, workshop. We invite also the ministry in charge of uh, this problem of telecommunication. And secondly, to say that uh, Cameroon is fully involved to be part of the the, the sponsor team of the coming resolution of the next World Health Assembly. Thank you. Excellent to hear. Thank you so much. And uh, good to hear from Cameroon 
sort of how the engagement at the country level of transform health around these data governments principle really make a difference because that's what in the end of the day is really needed that the countries who take that leadership to protect uh you know the citizens and enable you know to enable innovation enable but at the same time have that that right balance so i would like to kind of close that panel here now really a big thank you and then the government that's not a real government not the citizens <laughs> <laughs> represented <laughs> are invited to 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 come up here uh, on on stage and um, thank you so much for for the multi stakeholder panel and whilst you're coming up we have a, a little change in the program uh, dr patrick amoth uh, who is the acting director general uh, for health of the ministry in kenya and he's as well the chair of the who executive board uh, he was called in at last uh, minute, uh, but he did send uh, kindly enough a representative, uh, Dr. Bernards. Uh, I'm not sure I can read your, your name, Ogutu. Okay, so I got it right, Dr. Ogutu. Uh, he's the chief research officer from the Kenyan Medical Research uh, Institute. And then we have Professor Mohamed Nasmir Sambo the executive secretary and CEO of the National Health Insurance Scheme in Nigeria. A big welcome. And then we have as well Dr. Grace Magembe, Deputy Permanent Secretary uh, for Health and Chair of the Data Use Project Governance Unit in Tanzania. Uh, very much welcome uh, to have you here. And then we have as well Miss de Gurcels Asana. She is from the French presidency of the EU's sort of uh, local representative here in Geneva. Is that correct? Yeah, thank you. And uh, so it's really great to have you all here. I would like to start with uh, Dr. Okutu. You know, the, Kenya has done a lot on, on digital space and the government really has, you know, pushed forward. Uh, what do you see, you know, the government could do more to strengthen governance of health data and what sort of action do you see is needed more at the global level and uh, linked to the discussion of uh, the World Health Assembly uh, in the future in terms of health data governance. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, just a disclaimer that I, I cut across partly in the government and partly in academia and I was thrown here because I was also involved in generating the data. But I think what we tend to forget is one, COVID was a pandemic. Actually, data solutions is a much bigger pandemic for the health sector, which there's a big overload coming. And the beautiful, the sad thing about it is that the health sector had been used to two or three commodities, diagnostics, drugs, and vaccines. All of these take tens of years to develop, and within that framework, the legislation is available to control its adoption. But data solutions spring up overnight, and nobody is ready for how you are going to get it in place. And if you look at it, which of the countries is able to reform and review their, their code of regulations every year? to catch up with technology. There are very few. You can count them on, on your fingers. So that's why the lag. And I think this is something that is very easy to innovate, but everybody's innovating, not looking at I'm throwing it to the ocean, or who is going to take care of it. And I think this is something that the government how to play a catch up and nobody prepares them for this. And I think these are some of the things that we have to deal with at country level and possibly work out. What are you thinking of doing? Because we have now been discussions in that. This is a time we need to bring the business schools, the law schools, and the schools of public health to really start working on the public health law because even for research, it is becoming a hindrance is that you are not able to make sure the law is in tandem with the advancement in technology. And this is even worse of when it comes to data. The sad thing is that as much as we know, the health sector is the last area usually for technological transformation, and that happens. 
Modeling is used in the financial sector for making decisions, but in health, it was the last to be adopted. And I think this just because of the inherent risk that the health sector possibly fears. And I think these are some of the, the hoops that people need to possibly go over and it will take a bit of time. And those who want to be efficient, deal with commodities, but don't want those who want to be effective, deal with human beings, which means it takes a time to get them moving, but you become more effective. And these are the things that one has to do when it comes to the whole of the, the data. And I think one of the things is that what we are forgetting is, is basically one of the bigger things that we need to be very cognizant of is who is the owner of the agenda and how have we marketed the agenda. And I think that's basically because of the divide in capacities there's this mistrust. I have the data, but I don't have the capacity to interrogate it and use it. So if I throw it out there, somebody else is going to use it, and I don't know how trustworthy to my interest is going to be. And I think this is the divide that we need to really find ourselves surmounting. And I think these are the things that at country level, we are trying to make sure that that trust is built in country and then look at it across the border. And I think these are some of the fundamental things that possibly we need to look at. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And um, I thank you. When you were talking, remind me of an African proverb that says, if we want to go fast, go alone. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you just reminded me of an African proverb that goes uh, that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I do think within the digital health space, we do need to kind of see how can we go far together, but a little bit faster than so far. <laughs> and actually, COVID has showed us that we needed to go together at higher speed in uh, the transformation of, of digital health, as you said. I mean, in the financial sectors, uh, you know, they have been using data-driven decision making for for 20, 30 years. I mean, the, 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 and it's really driving. And I think there is quite a bit of, of catch up. But because it's with with people, and 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 data around people is so so precious that we really need to get it right. So let's go just across the from Kenya to Tanzania to Dr. Magembe, who really, in, I think, in Tanzania is, is really some really interesting work happening around uh, sort of advancing digital health and health data governance. Can you sort of share a little bit how you think you can, you know, others could learn from your example? Maybe best to use that microphone. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, when uh, my daughter there, I think she's Jason was talking i was saying that she wants answers from the government i was like here i am <laughs> the government but i'm not sure if i have all the answers that you want well uh talking of um an effective digital health system we are referring to collection of data processing as well as interpreting that data which normally in the health sector is a uh, very vast and complex data. So the complex part of it, I think that's what makes the government to be always very, very, very careful. Very, very careful. Because actually when one walks in a hospital or in a health facility, or they volunteer their data to the government, they have to be assured of confidentiality, protection of their data. So sometimes governments do what they do, not because they just want to be bureaucratic, but it's just in the spirit of making sure that whatever individuals volunteer to us is well protected. And it can only be shared either with a consent. And when you want to share it, actually, you have to see which level you share which kind of data. Because uh, talking of data, there's the person who volunteer the data, there's the person who collects the data, there's the person who processes the data, inter does the interpretation of the data, there's a person who actually takes the data and uh, changes it into policies and guidelines and stuff like that. But all those levels, there has to be a limit as to what one can access and what they cannot access. Just like how we do in our offices, 
there's an office, you know, based on my ID card, I can access that office, but there's a place I cannot access. And that is not bureaucracy, but it is done for a very good purpose that, you know, you should be able to access what is within your, your limit. And the people have spoken very well about uh, ensuring that people are protected. That's the whole essence of uh, data governance, but also making sure that information is available across the different levels equitably. So going to what Tanzania has done so far in terms of um, advancing the agenda of uh, data, health data governance. As one of the speakers here said, one of the very important step is actually to make sure that every stakeholder is part and parcel. That addresses a lot of uh, challenges that you know have been you know uh, presented here. So in Tanzania, we have formed what we call a national digital steering committee. This is the main uh, committee that oversees all digital health initiatives in the country. And uh, it is a committee that has got representation from the government, not only the health sector. We are the health sector, there's also the local government, but there's uh, the president office, but also the private sector is also part of it. Okay, so that is the national uh, steering committee where we think, you know, everything that people have, I mean, be it a private sector, or public sector, that's where we table all our issues within the steering committee. And this steering committee is chaired by the permanent secretary from the Minister of Health and the permanent secretary from the president office. So it is a serious matter. If you breach it, you know what the consequences could be. So again, we have formulated uh, the digital health strategy uh, 2019 to 2024, which has got a number of uh, strategic goals. Some of them have been mentioned, but uh, actually mainly is to strengthen the digital health governance and leadership, but also to improve patient care. You know, data governance is all about improving patient care. Okay, so that's also part of it, but also uh, it's also uh, our fundraising, sort of like um, an investment roadmap that we use uh, to raise funding for supporting various digital health initiatives uh, in the country. Let me take this opportunity to, to appreciate PATH. I think they're here. They're one of the partners that we are working with. Okay, so we have established what we call the data use partnership. This is a partnership, so all of us are there, okay? And uh, it is uh, led by the government, it's an initiative led by the government, but we are supported also by, by, by PATH. And the aim is just one thing, you know, to strengthen data management across all the levels that I was, I was talking about. So that's what actually Tanzania has so far done in terms of uh, advancing this agenda of uh, uh, data, uh, digital health, uh, governance. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, that example. I'm going now to Professor Sambo. You're the CEO as well of the National Health Insurance Scheme and you know given the, the, the huge population of Nigeria in the years to come this might be one of the world's largest insurance scheme where where, where health data is a critical issue for, for an insurance scheme. Does the kind of current sort of you know health data governance frameworks give you a bit sleepless night. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in discussing the issue of uh, data governance, there are some critical issues that we have to be uh, very aware of. Number one, why are we generating the data? Number two, where are the sources of data? Number three, how are the data? How is the data generated? Number four, how is the data aggregated? Number five, how is the data uh, processed? Number six, how is the data uh, utilized? So, um, if we take this uh, very clearly, all the people that are within the framework of the governance of data must have this uh, very clear at the back of their mind. Because if you miss any step in this process, the, the, the veracity of the data that you will, will be able to generate might not be there. And you will not even have the, uh, the good understanding of the value or the volume 
or the uh, or the but the value, the veracity, the uh, of the data that you will generate, or the velocity of the beta data that you will generate. So um, uh, in Nigeria, these issues have been clearly captured. Why do we need a data? We want a data for effective decision making, especially towards attainment of universal health coverage in line with uh, sustainable development goals. Number two, what are the various sources of data in, in, in the healthcare industry? You collect data from hospitals, you collect data from community, you collect data from research. All these are sources of various health data. In fact, we have even recognized the fact that census is a very important form of data that we require because it will enable, enable us to get all the necessary denominators to calculate our infant mortality rate maternal mortality rate and so on and so forth then when you come to the process of generating the, the data we are convinced that there must be transition between uh, from manual and semi-manual collection of data process to developing over aching digital uh, uh, digital technology processes so that you have a seamless mechanism of data generation that will be real time that the velocity can be very good in terms of how quick you can aggregate the data in a very big uh, country like Nigeria. So uh, in, in, in generally speaking, uh, for, 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 for effective data governance in Nigeria, there is a Ministry of Communication, which has been renamed uh, in line with the global contemporary uh, uh, system it is now renamed as a Ministry of, of, of uh, Telecommunication and Digital Economy because the government is promoting the e-governance in every facet of life. And uh, part of the, uh, the, 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 the effort that government is doing is to ensure that every Nigerian has a need number irrespective of where he lives and need number that can be able to get all the necessary data on individuals, about 200 million people. Then at the, uh, at the level of Ministry of Health, uh, since as far back, back as 2015, there was, a, there was an effort to develop what is called a national strategic framework for data, for data, uh, for, 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 for digital transformation, which is in line with International Techno, uh, Techno Telecommunication Union, ITU. Then uh, this policy has, is now currently being, being reversed revise uh, to conform with the various uh, activities that is happening in the healthcare uh, eco space or ecosystem. Uh, in the National Health Insurance Scheme, we have realized that the rate at which we are, we are moving with respect to the enrollment and management social health insurance scheme is not as fast as we, we want. Therefore, we now decided to develop what we call a digital uh, digital vision for the health insurance in Nigeria. And in, do, in doing this digital, digital vision, what we try to do is to do what is called uh, the situation analysis to identify what are the digital gaps and uh, what are the dig digital remedy that we need to put in place. We take cognizance of the fact that Nigeria, some people say, is a multinational state because it's, it's, it's a very big country and uh, it, it has uh, some, the, the governance system is, is that of semi autonomous. That is to say, it is, a, it is decentralized. You have sub national uh, government that are very powerful, they can develop their policies in, in healthcare. But we recognize the fact that we need an over aching. Uh, a digital system that can be able to aggregate all the data that is coming from the national, uh, from, from the sub-national government to the national government. So uh, at, at present, we have been able to develop uh, a, a very big uh, digital system, which has many component in terms of uh, technology, developing VSAT in, at, at, at the state level, developing M MPLS, and uh, developing all those uh, and ensuring interconnectivity where the, the fiber optic is possible. Uh, we, we fiber optic is used where in a rural community where fiber optic cannot reach, we are utilizing satellite system. 
So the complement of, of the fiber system and the satellite system will now enable us to generate the data. Because what, what we want is that we want at the level of the uh, clients who are enrolling the National Health Insurance Scheme, they can use their mobile app can, and, 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 and join the National Health, Health Insurance System. We can, they can, we can uh, in terms of payment system, claim management system, you can have an easy way to do a claims management. At the, at the level of healthcare facilities, they must have comprehensive uh, electronic medical record. And at the national level, we have been able to, uh, to, to define what is uh, application program interface, API, that every subnational government should have so as to ensure easy interoperability. And uh, the major issue that we are confronted is the issue that has to do with uh, the finance, the investment in te the technology is very high. Number two, the change management processes. How do we ensure that you, you train all the healthcare facilities, okay? To help all the healthcare facilities and, uh, and all the actors within the social health insurance scheme to learn how to utilize this digital transformation and be able to get the data and uh, all the issue that has to do with protection in terms of uh, uh, validity and uh, veracity of that uh, as safeguarded. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I mean, you, you highlight uh, the complexity that, you know, really need to take care of all these different aspects that this is really a, a very complex system in terms of health as itself, but then the whole digital component and the data governance piece is one important piece, but it's not the entire uh, sort of system. And so I'm going now to Sana de Courcel. She's the health counselor at the uh, French mission here in Geneva. And given that France presidency of the EU and the EU recently launched the digital health ethics principle and the European health data space, and actually President Macron has been really a champion on AI and, and I know the French government in Paris actually becoming like a hotbed for digital health sort of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. How do you see that the French government could actually bring some of this to the global level? in need of really kind of a global health data governance framework over to you thank you good evening ladies and gentlemen and first i would like to thank you for uh, organizing this uh, meeting and inviting us i'd like to congratulate uh, transform health for its engagement and its activities because as digital health have been fragmented and uncoordinated for many years now the advent of the pandemic has increased uh, its activity and new entrants in this space and thank you for that for us there is no question that global and regional uh, governance mechanisms uh, are needed in this space um, i have to say that on this issue we definitely work at the european level um, let me just explain a little bit where we are now during it his inaugural speech, President Macron, uh, um, his inaugural speech uh, of the Council of the European Union on December uh, 2021, um, he called for building the next stages of a European ambition based on shared European values. And this approach was particularly relevant for digital health as illustrated by the pandemic crisis. Indeed, as um, the acceleration of the deployment of digital health is really the reality, it seems essential to formalize a European, the European values which will condition its future development while integrating the search for sovereignty in the European approach and method. And it was absolutely necessary at that time uh, when the legislative work on the um, European health data space regulation was expected to start under the French presidency. Indeed, this proposed new regulation is very ambitious and addresses a very large scope, covering the main issues um, and main uses of health data from primary use in the context of the patient's patient pathway to secondary use of data, like data health reuse. Um, and in medical devices or wellness hubs. This regulation aims at answering the wish of citizens to harness their own data and meet European expectations on the reuse of data for public policy, research and innovation. 
the text will have strong impacts on the health and digital health ecosystem at European and national level. Due to its wide scope and the issues it will raise, the proposed regulation will obviously have to be based on the trust of European citizens. As you said before, uh, it's a, a, a question for, for uh, everyone and every citizen of, of the world and answer expected questioning from all stakeholders. The recent experience of the EU digital COVID certificate had demo has demonstrated, if necessary, this evidence. The work of the EU DTC has opened discussions on fundamental European values and ethics. Uh, the EU DTC technical architecture has been followed these requirements and we'll, we believe this explains its success. For instance, the EU digital COVID certificate system inspired by France has been developed into a global standard with 35 um, third countries and territories across five continents share, um, having joined the system so far in addition to the 27 member states of the EU. The success of the EU digital COVID certificate has truly contributed to the reception of safe international travel. This demonstrates the importance of Euro for, for Europe to choose a model based on ethics, as citizens expect authorities to implement solutions based on trust. Ethics allow for trust, and they are therefore a sine qua non for moving forward. Considering this experience and as part of its role and responsibility, the French presidency of the Council of the European Union has offered also to formalize ethical values for digital health. Such an approach is also part of the national digital health roadmap in France, since it is based on three pillars, ethics, interoperability, thank you for my, for my accent, and security. Uh, Member States and the European Commission soon recognized this step as a prerequisite to pave the way for the new regulation. Building on a proposal from the, our presidency, European ethical principles for digital health were discussed and unanimously adopted by the EL's network representatives on January 26. Choice was then made to express clear principles in a direct and a pointed way so that they can be understood by all citizens. This was a long but a necessary explanation regarding the why and the how, the, and this applies the same way at world level, we think. Trust and ambition trigger a need and the rationale to move forward working on shared values if we intend to collectively have an ambition about digital use. This is a conviction and you can translate it into a proposition from the French side. Our government can propose to elevate this to the global space and strongly believes this need to be part of any global health data governance framework. And finally, we welcome the establishment of a department dedicated to digital health issues at WHO. It's about time. I think they are still uh, looking for a director. If someone is interested, that would be great to have someone and someone great uh, in this family. And we have high expectation of WHO's works on this topic and on this agenda at the three levels, national, regional and global level. I will stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think you just mentioned on the important role of WHO and I would like to actually invite maybe it's you should join us here. Uh, Craig Burgess is the unit head of data coordination and, and governance at WHO. And I would like to thank here the, the, the government uh, panel really for, for their insight and sharing. And we'd like to hand over to you, Craig, sort of to make some remarks, reflections from what you've heard from this first multi-stakeholder panel and from uh, the government related to health data governance and this kind of you know, the next steps, what you see should happen from a WHO and what's the role of the World Health Assembly. So um, thanks very much um, for inviting me. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and I really want to appreciate the partnership effort that's uh, taken place to really pull this thing together over many, many months. And also hearing the diversity of views is really, really important. That diversity is crucial to making uh, data work really. 
So I've got a, a couple of things um, for your consideration. One is just a reflection on data per se, and then a reflection on why I think from some of the panel discussions we need stronger data governance. Um, and then a bit of a reality check, and then some next, check, next um, steps. So we heard tonight, um, really data is a strategic asset, but it's only a strategic asset if it's used. And from our point of view, we're looking at three different elements for data governance really to work. It's quality, it's integrity, and it was so reassuring to hear the word trust multiple times. Trust lies at the heart of data governance because as someone, a panelist mentioned, it relies on transparency, transparency of communication, transparency of whose data is it and what happens to my data when it's handed over to someone else. That is crucial. And I think many of us in WHO certainly believe that data governance can strengthen all those three aspects, quality, integrity, and trust as long as it's put to good use and for outcomes. So let me give you two contexts. On the one hand, there are many contexts in which we live in where there is no shortage of data. There is almost too much data. For example, in three Southeast Asian countries, there were time and motion studies from nurse midwives, i.e. the frontline healthcare workers, who spent 33% of their time collecting data, filling in forms, ignoring the data, and transmitting it, I'm going to say upwards, but to the administration that requires that data. We talk about a human resource crisis. There's a third of a nurse, nurse midwife's time straight away. So on that, in that context, and we also have lots of examples where we're overwhelmed with data. We don't know what to do. It's raw, unprocessed data, not useful. It needs used. So that's where I think we would argue data governance plays a crucial role to make it usable. And what do we mean when we're usable? We're trying to promote the aspect of a data journey or so that everyone can see the aspects of data there. And that includes data collection, data storage, safe storage, data sharing appropriately, data analysis. And that analysis part is crucial because many people, people's eyes glaze over when we mention the word statistics. Statisticians and data analysts lie at the heart of power of data in our, in our view. And then use, use about getting the right information to the right person at the right time. That data journey can be quite a powerful way of communicating data. So on the one hand, no shortage of data. And on the other, sometimes there's a massive paucity of data with huge data gaps. Over 30% of the countries right now cannot measure their SDG indicators in their totality. You would think that things have been thought out. They haven't, and there are very good reasons for that. There are two main reasons. One is capacity, either capacity at the institutional level or the individual level to do that data journey that I just mentioned. So capacity building of national institutes, we feel, is very, very important. And secondly, one of the other reasons that uh, data gaps are so, um, so crucial and there is the leaving no one behind. There are many instances where there are weak governmental infrastructures, for example, fragile settings, conflict settings, urban poor, someone mentioned already, rural, um, rural remote settings, and communities that are affected by stigma or discrimination, such as youth. We heard a very strong voice tonight from our youth ambassador here. And in those contexts, we would advocate definite use of civil society and NGOs and private sector partnerships to strengthen and plug the data gaps where they're needed, where, where government infrastructure isn't as strong as it could be. So it brings me on to data governance per se, and I'm not going to dwell on it long, but I think we all need to look very carefully about how we define data governance. What is it? I think it means different things to different people. From our point of view in WHO, we're currently looking at a model of standards, which includes principles, legal frameworks and policy mechanisms, solutions, which include cybersecurity and protecting the data, i.e. whose data is it and how does it get protected, especially amongst anonymized data. And then lastly, structures, the right structures in place to strengthen accountability. And when I say accountability, time and time again, we hear, well, there's a joke, how do you make God laugh? Does anyone know the answer? Tell him or her your plans. So we can, we can think of policies and plans, but actually accountability comes, it needs teeth. So when I say structures, a structure that has some accountability mechanism at national level, perhaps, that holds 
different groups accountable to the policies that need to be implemented. Actually implementing policy is very important. And then we heard tonight also the aspect of ethics. Ethics is crucially important. That's one of our departments that we're, we're working very closely within WHO. So I'm saying all this on purpose because it can get quite theoretical quite quickly. So I'm gonna give you three practical examples and maybe keep these practical examples in the front of our minds when we discuss data governance. So what does data really mean to a Minister of Health or Minister of Finance when they're looking at allocating very scarce resources and the best value resources for their, for their sector, health sector? And I would say, again, it's about getting the right data to the right person at the right time um, for a key decision maker. The second reality check is much more close to the field. Think of a nurse midwife in, for example, rural Nepal, who has to plan every year, what is her denominator so that she can plan how many pregnant women she has in her village, and therefore how many kids need immunized, what is the nutritional needs of that population, and how is she going to reach them at least four or five times every year to deliver vaccines, to deliver other postnatal and crucial important services for her population. That all requires data and data that she uses. And some of us experience different sources of data. There's a a actual jotter that's quite often used, which is her real data. There's an administrative form that the government uses, which might be very different to the figures that she moves, she uses. And then there's sometimes even a, da a data source that keeps donors happy as well. And I think I personally have seen three different examples of that. So when we say reality check and data governance, we're thinking of trying to help and support frontline health workers. And then lastly, on an individual basis, many of us use data for, uh, to look at um, how we improve our fitness, how we change our behaviors. How can we make sure that the entities there, such as Facebook, such as Apple, such as many different entities, actually empower us and we can trust them with our data where we're moving as well. So I give those three very real examples because we think it's important to kind of apply a reality check to our data governance framework. So it brings me to kind of next steps. So, and, then, and there's, there's three thoughts I have. So one is, I think you're on the cusp of something very exciting. And I think you, I, I encourage you to see this as an opportunity, an opportunity to actually create a movement. I'm, a, I'm actually a civil society person at heart, but I think you can actually create a movement to generate change. And we're talking about change for better data with integrity that actually empowers people and can change people's health. You can create demand and you can generate accountability through a different mechanism. So I'd encourage you to keep on doing what you are doing and generate that movement. The second next step is, as I said before, sometimes as we try and make God laugh, tell him your plans, actually get practical very quickly. See whether you can find some good data governance practices that you can readily share, share in a wider community that are actually practical that people can pick up on. And that is in the, the spirit of the Data Governance Summit that you mentioned last year, picking up on good practices. And then lastly, I want to reassure you, one of your calls was, uh, we want to kind of push WHO. We're listening, many of us are listening, and we want to kind of work in partnership. We can't, any of us, we can't do it alone. We need to do it in partnership. So I encourage you to do whatever shape or form next year's World Health Assembly takes, or whether it's a resolution or not, there's some key time points um, in the next 12 months that we need to look at. And we hope that we can work with you to look at the, the best resolution for that. So those are my reflections. And thanks for the other panel. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Craig. And uh, I think the, the kind of call of, uh, you know, this, this really exciting moment of creating that movement is really, and within movements, the most important ones are the early adopters. And it was very encouraging to hear, like from Cameroon, who is becoming an early adopter, he will support it as a member state. You know, we hear from France, Tanzania, you know, Kenya, Nigeria. There are so many governments who really see that. And I think that's, you know, the WHO, Craig's job is influenced what member states actually want the WHO to do. And so if member states take that leadership, then it will happen. And it's really in, in the, 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 the interest of everyone. And, and, and I think just to summarize up now, and I must apologize, we are 12 minutes over time for me as a Swiss uh, a moderator <laughs> um, and then is a cocktail so there was a question at the end can we do that our cocktail is that okay or you're a young participant so i'll give you actually the last sort of word so it doesn't even need to be a question you can make a, a statement 
Okay, then let's have the question first and then we wrap it up. So, uh, thank you for the panel. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Mendogas Galvasas. I work with AI and digital health. And uh, in this panel, uh, I've been hearing that we speak about uh, data governance in this bottom-up approach from patient uh, to the government. But there is one step above it. And in that step, there are today three major companies that are in the process of the data progress that Professor Sambo and Mr. Burgess mentioned in their remarks. I wonder, governments, um, is this the future, let's say in five or 10 years, that the data of the countries of the WHO is passing through, let's say, three companies, three major players, or is the future more decentralized or some alternative thoughts? No, I think this, this is one of the things that might not be easy to find uh, an answer to, because I think basically we are in the age where the, the plane, the nose of the plane is off on the runway. And we have to make all that we do running. And I think some of this will come clearer as people look at what is the best fit for what we want to use it for. And I think now the main thing is people will be looking for, do we need to create the culture we need? And who is attacking the liability? Do we share liability and enjoy the beneficence for all of us? And I think these are some of the critical things when, when this comes up. And I think some of these at country level we have seen in Kenya, we took the first step and it spanned everything. But I think these are things that will become very clear. Some of them, you might think they are relevant today, come tomorrow, the whole landscape changes. So I think these are the way to approach it. Anybody else want to comment on this? Thank you very much. Um, appreciating the global role of World Health Organization will be very, very critical if we are to um, have a situation whereby at the level, at the supranational level, there could be some collaboration for, 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 for data exchange in future. And that data exchange can give us uh, ability to, to, to be able to say this is a regional picture of a, of a particular situation. And through that inter, interchange, you can even have a, a global picture of, 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 uh, of, of, of data. And, it, and this is very critical in the era of emerging and re-emerging diseases, whereby pandemics are coming. And uh, if there is ability to share data at the highest level, it will be very, very fantastic in terms of tracking new epidemics and, and controlling them. Thank you very much. Yeah, again, just adding on what my colleagues have said, I think uh, data exchange is happening right now. It is happening right now. But uh, if you recall, what I said is, um, it's all about what data for what use and sharing at what level for what reason but it's not like there's no data sharing it is happening right now and i'll still recommend the use of uh, forums where all partners will come in and agree like which data should be shared at which level but we can't really uh, say that strictly this data has to be you know uh, kept by the government no i think data sharing is happening right now we are exchanging data but we're really governed by the rules that you know what data should be shared to who at what time for what use so data is accessible thank you Maybe to your question, just one other comment from um, there are other companies who have very different plans. And uh, disclose, I don't have any shares with Microsoft, but Brad, Brad Smith, who actually is an alumni from the Graduate Institute here in Geneva, they're working on sovereign data clouds where they work with government that, you know, it is the servers are in Kenya, they are there. And, and there is this sort of ability that private sector can do things different. And, and that's why it's such a critical point of time that governments need to speak up what they want, whether they want that you have three globals who scrap it all and we end up really as modern day data slave as I started in my introduction, or government steps up and says, no, we want sovereign data clouds. We work with private sector and if you can provide that, 
yes, we work with you. I think that's the end of tonight. The conversation can carry on uh, our uh, cocktail and uh, maybe I don't know where the cocktail actually is. So it's just around the corner here. Let's give a big round of applause to Transform Health, all the partners and the panel up here. Thank you so much.